Imagine for a moment that you and a sibling are at the helm of a real estate and media empire, holding the reins of a multi-billion dollar fortune. What avenues would you explore with such unfathomable wealth at your disposal? Perhaps you'd invest in groundbreaking philanthropic ventures like the Rockefeller family, or maybe you'd indulge in the ultimate luxuries that only the richest can afford, from owning private jets to collecting exotic art pieces, just like the Dukes of Norfolk. Indeed, the possibilities are as vast as the wealth itself, stretching the limits of imagination and ambition. However, if your surname happens to be Barclay, you and your next of kin's approach to this immense wealth diverges significantly from conventional paths. Certainly, for the Barclay brothers, their billions weren't just a ticket to luxury and philanthropy. They became the means to an unparalleled experiment in sovereignty and power. Taking over a small island, they transformed it into their own personal dominion, altering its century-old laws and essentially creating a private political playground leveraging their fortune to help grow their coffers even further, much to the chagrin of the UK. These bold brethren orchestrated a scenario few could conceive, let alone execute. In today's episode of Old Money Luxury, we'll dive into the fascinating journey of the Barclay brothers, exploring how they took a multi-billion dollar fortune and ran with it to take over an island, reshaping reality to fit their vision. In the high-octane world of global business, Sir David and Sir Frederick Barclay are the magicians pulling rabbits out of hats, with a fortune to the tune of 3.9 billion US dollars to prove it. And their empire, built on the pillars of media, retail and real estate, speaks to their knack for spotting golden opportunities where others see dead ends, and diving into their corporate collection, you'll find it's no ordinary lineup. First up, Ellerman Lines, once a commanding force in the shipping world, navigating the high seas with its cargo and shipping services. It's like the seasoned captain of the fleet, steering through international waters with the ease of a seasoned sea dog. Then there's Littlewoods, a retail giant with a history as rich as any treasure chest. From catalogue sales to high street stores, Littlewoods has clothed and catered to generations of Brits, making it a household name. Yodel steps onto the scene as the courier extraordinaire, darting across the UK with parcels and packages. And lastly, the Telegraph Media Group, wielding the mighty pen, or should we say, keyboard, as its sword, brings news, commentary and insights to a thirsty audience. In an age of information, TMG is like the town crier and the printing press rolled into one, delivering the word to the nation's doorsteps and screens. Together, these companies form a constellation of commercial success, each star shining brightly in its corner of the Barclay universe. Furthermore, the Barclay Brothers saga could easily be a modern-day Dickens tale, charting their rise from the humble beginnings in the accounts department of the General Electric Company to the zenith of capitalist success. Their trophy case of acquisitions shines brightly with the Ritz Hotel in London, a purchase that epitomized their fearless and triumphant strategy. This opulent haven, alongside their impressive collection of prime real estate, yachts and jets, underscores their appetite for the lavish lifestyle. And a notable emblem of their success was the Lady Beatrice, a luxury yacht that floated as a palace on the sea, reflecting the grandeur the Barclay brothers have come to embody. Named after their mother, this 60-meter testament to luxury, complete with classic art and Baroque furniture, required a crew of 17 and an annual upkeep of $3 million, pocket change for the Barclays. But their adventures weren't confined to the seas. The skies also bore witness to their luxury with a Sikorsky S-76A helicopter, symbolizing their penchant for high-end, efficient travel. However, their journey was not without its share of turbulence. The acquisition of Breku, a tiny island neighboring Sark, thrust them into the spotlight, igniting controversies and legal skirmishes that tested Sark's age-old feudal laws to their limits. You see, Sark is a small island in the Channel Islands, known for its unique blend of breathtaking scenery and ancient feudal laws, making it a place where modernity and tradition intertwine. Yet this picturesque setting became the backdrop for the intriguing saga of the Barclay Brothers. 
whose penchant for luxury and ambitious endeavors extended beyond the realms of the sea and sky. Thus, the narrative of the Barclay brothers is a complex weave of ambition, legal battles and luxury, marked by their status as tax exiles and controversies surrounding the tax arrangements of properties like the Ritz Hotel. Yet, as the story unfolded, it led to a pivotal moment that would shock both admirers and critics alike. In a dramatic turn of events, facing mounting pressure and scrutiny, the Barclays made a controversial decision to evade authorities, taking their multi-billion pound empire into uncharted territories. What drove them to such lengths, and what would be the consequences of their bold escape? In the heart of West London, Hammersmith to be precise, were born David and Frederick Barclay on the 27th of October 1934. Soon, the twins, identical in appearance but unique in ambition, would grow to be luminaries in the realm of British entrepreneurship. Now, their journey began under the shadow of loss with their father, Frederick Hugh Barclay, a traveling salesman passing away when the boys were just on the cusp of adolescence at 12. Then, their mother, Beatrice Cecilia Taylor, took the helm of the family ship, steering her eight children through the choppy waters of post-World War II Britain. You see, Hammersmith, at this time, was itself licking its wounds from the war's bombings, with the Barclay family and their neighbors living in a tapestry of shared spaces and makeshift accommodations. Amidst this backdrop of recovery and reconstruction, the Barclays saga took its first turn. Leaving school at the tender age of 16, they entered the corporate world through the doors of the General Electric Company. Consequently, working in the accounts department during the early 1950s offered them a front row seat to the era's business machinations, a time when the country was rebooting its economy, and London was buzzing with the electric current of rejuvenation. However, it wasn't long before the twins decided that the corporate ladder was too constricting for their broader ambitions. With a dash of audacity, they traded their calculators and ledgers for paintbrushes and wallpaper, embarking on a venture into painting and decorating. This pivot from the structured path of employment to the unpredictable waters of entrepreneurship was the real beginning of their ascent. Indeed, it wasn't just a career change. It was the dawn of the Barclay Brothers' legacy, marking their transition from ordinary employees to architects of their own destiny. Soon, David and Frederick Barclay took their entrepreneurial spirits to the retail world, opening Candy Corner, a tobacconist and confectioner's shop on the outskirts of Kensington. And managing such a venture at that time meant navigating the complexities of a society where smoking was widely accepted and sweet treats were in high demand, blending the traditional with the pleasure of the era. Yet, despite their best efforts, the Barclay brothers encountered significant challenges. By November 1960, a disagreement with their landlord led to both Frederick and his brother Douglas being declared bankrupt. However, this hurdle did nothing to dampen their resolve. And during this period, David Barclay's personal life flourished as he married Zoe Newton, a ballet dancer turned model, celebrated for her appearances in Dairy Council advertisements. Frederick, on the other hand, delved into the world of painting and decorating and took a pioneering approach to transforming boarding houses into hotels. Next, the 1960s saw the Barclays founding Hillgate Estate Agents, embarking on a venture that positioned David at the helm as director with his wife, Zoe, supporting as co-director. By 1968, the leadership baton had passed to Frederick, who spearheaded the family enterprises. The brothers' ventures received a significant boost with substantial loans from the Crown agents, facilitating their acquisition of guest plan hotels and the prestigious Londonderry House Hotel on Park Lane in 1970. As the decade progressed, the Barclays' business empire expanded to include breweries, casinos, and significant forays into property development. And their acquisition of the Howard Hotel in 1975, overlooking the Thames, underscored their burgeoning influence in the hospitality sector. This period also saw Frederick marrying Hiroko Asada, further enriching the Barclay family's social landscape. The Barclays' aggressive expansion strategies continued unabated into the 80s, culminating in the acquisition of Elliman, a prominent brewing and shipping group, for £45 million in 1983. 
and this strategic investment proved fruitful as they later divested its brewing division for 240 million pounds, more than a 4x return on investment. Subsequently, the profits from these ventures were strategically reinvested into various ambitious projects, including the acquisition of the iconic Ritz Hotel in 1995. This move was not just a transaction, it was an emblem of their ascension to the zenith of luxury and a bold declaration of their prowess in the hospitality industry. You see, the Ritz, with its illustrious history and association with unparalleled elegance, became a jewel in their crown, highlighting the Barclays' ability to identify and seize opportunities that resonated not just financially, but culturally and socially. And beyond the shores of the United Kingdom, the Barclays extended their influence into the international arena, making significant investments in Gotthas Larsen, a Bermuda-based shipping conglomerate, and the Automotive Financial Group, a global motor retail chain. These ventures further solidified their status as visionaries with a keen eye for diversification and global market dynamics. However, with great power comes great responsibility. And soon the immense influence the Barclay brothers wielded would lead to a testing of their ability to keep on the clear and moral course throughout the gaining of unfathomable wealth. As they embarked on their extraordinary spree of real estate triumphs, the Barclay brothers laid claim to the tenement of Breco in 1993. This modest sibling to the island of Sark, nestled within the Channel Islands, caught their eye not just for its scenic allure, but also for its fiscal advantages and the chance to forge a significant footprint within a distinctive self-regulated domain. Opting to settle there, the Barclays were drawn by the island's favorable tax status and the opportunity to influence a locale, boasting a storied and largely unaltered constitution that traces back centuries. And their presence on Breku was soon marked by the erection of a mock Gothic castle, a grand design by Quinlan Terry featuring formidable granite walls stretching 100 feet into the sky, complete with battlements, dual swimming pools, and even a helipad for their aerial comings and goings. However, the Barclays' tenure on Breco has not been without its controversies, primarily legal skirmishes with Sark's governance. Disputes ranged from infractions of Sark's motor vehicle prohibitions to aspirations for Breco's political secession, inspired by historical assertions that the island wasn't inherently tied to Sark's feudal grip. A particularly striking chapter in their island saga involved appealing to the European Court of Human Rights, challenging Sark's inheritance laws favoring primogeniture. Their legal battle aimed to democratize their estate's succession, ultimately compelling Sark's legislature to revise its inheritance statutes, thus allowing a state division among any children not just the eldest son. The Barclay brothers' arrival and subsequent actions on Sark and Breku also catalyzed significant socio-political change, culminating in the dissolution of Sark's 443-year-old feudal system and ushering in the island's first democratic elections in 2008, and their acquisition spree, which captured nearly a quarter of the island's real estate and a swath of pivotal businesses including the prime hospitality establishments, the sole construction entity, the exclusive estate agency, and a major stretch of the commercial artery, prompted a mixture of awe and apprehension. This economic stranglehold raised eyebrows not just among the islanders, but also within the corridors of UK governance, stirring debates over the potential for an imbalanced sway over Sark's future direction. You see, the Barclays' blueprint for the island envisioned a blend of the contemporary with the quaint charm of Sark, proposing infrastructure marvels like a funicular railway and a state-of-the-art helipad. However, these ambitions collided with the island's cherished traditions and its stringent codes, notably the blanket ban on aerial vehicles. The post-electoral shuttering of their operations in 2008, leading to a widespread job crisis, was perceived by many as a maneuver steeped in coercion, casting the brothers in a rather tyrannical light. The ensuing years have woven a complex narrative of legal skirmishes and vocal opposition to the Barclays' endeavors, embodying the friction between progress and preservation. The UK government, under the mantle of overseeing governance in its crown dependencies, found itself in a delicate balancing act, 
aiming to thwart any monopolistic dominance that could undermine Sark's democratic fabric. Contrary to the Barclays' narrative of philanthropic investment driven by an affinity for Sark and a quest for modernization, their actions have frequently been interpreted through a lens of strategic self-interest aimed at moulding Sark's socio-economic contours to their benefit. This ongoing saga, rich in both its economic implications and its impact on the communal ethos, continues to fuel discussions and concerns among Sark's populace and observers alike. Pondering the lasting legacy of the Barclays tenure on the island's socio-cultural history. And yet, the money printer kept ticking during these controversies, and soon, the Barclay brothers would increase their wallet sizes and bank balances even more. The acquisition of the Telegraph Group in 2004 by Sir David and Sir Frederick Barclay was a landmark moment in the UK's media landscape, commanding a £665 million price tag. This strategic move, finalised amidst a fiercely contested legal and bidding war, underscored the Barclays' resolve to incorporate one of Britain's most venerable newspapers into their expansive media empire. Yet the sales backdrop was fraught with the financial and legal woes of the previous owner, Conrad Black. His efforts to thwart the transaction ultimately fell short against the Barclays' assertive bid, and this acquisition expanded their holdings to include the Daily Telegraph, the Sunday Telegraph, and the Spectator magazine complementing their existing media interests in the Scotsman and the business. Far from a mere business manoeuvre, this acquisition embodied the Barclays' long-standing ambition to fortify their presence within the media sphere. However, this chapter also prefaced a series of even more future controversies and familial discord that would test the fabric of the Barclays' empire. At the heart of these challenges, was a succession dispute that entangled Sir David's sons, Aidan and Howard Barclay, and their uncle, Sir Frederick Barclay. This internal strife, spanning two decades, centred around the control and stewardship of key family assets, including the Telegraph Group and the Ritz Hotel. The dispute escalated into public and acrimonious legal battles, expanded by allegations of secret recordings and contentious negotiations over the Ritz's sale. The familial rift was starkly illuminated in February 2020 when revelations emerged of covert surveillance at the Ritz Hotel, capturing Sir Frederick Barclay in private discussions about the hotel's sale. This saga culminated in the sale of the Ritz to Qatari businessman Abdul Hadi Mana Al Hajri in April 2020 a transaction mired in controversy and dissent within the Barclay family. This ordeal, which became particularly pronounced following Sir David Barclay's passing in January 2021, laid bare the intricate challenges of succession within a family-owned conglomerate. The unfolding drama highlighted the tension between preserving family unity and managing a vast and diversified business empire spotlighting the precarious balance between generational dynamics and the stewardship of a multifaceted corporate legacy. And now, we'd like to see you in the comments. Which wealthy British entrepreneurs would you like us to feature next on this channel? We look forward to hearing from you. And thanks again for joining us for another episode of Old Money Luxury.